morning, church. Please stand and worship with us. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. trial and the change this one thing remains this one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails
Good morning. I'd like to read to you this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. <clears throat> In my study Bible, the question is asked after this is, or concerning this, can we earn God's approval? No, but we can do our best to allow God's work to show in our lives. Though we are approved by grace, not works, we demonstrate that we have been approved when results of his grace in us can be seen. What we are on the inside is recognized by the evidence we produce on the outside. Would you pray with me, please? Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings you give each and every one of us. Help us to be more like you, be the Christians you would have us be, and let our your grace be shown through us by what we do each and every day. We ask that you be with us, help us be guides to those who are around us. As we partake of these emblems this morning, help us to remember the sacrifice that you made for us that you gave your humanly body here that we could follow you and have everlasting life in heaven. These things I ask in Christ's name, amen. Hope you have the implement, emblems at home to take. <clears throat> For I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant. In my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. much 
Good morning, Williamstown Christian Church. I am so glad that we have the opportunity to at least have a sermon and a message together this way. Um, while it is not ideal, we would much rather have everyone be here in the building together. We also didn't think it was wise with some of the positive cases that we've had in the church to bring everybody back together. Um, instead, we'll just kind of let that cool down for a week before we get back together and worship together. But if you remember the last couple of times that we were together for, you know, a little while, we've been in the book of Matthew. But the last time we were together, we were in Matthew 22. And what we were talking about is this idea that the Pharisees were coming to Jesus and they were trying to distract him. They were trying to take him off mission. And what we talked about is that the way that they were doing this two weeks ago is they were trying to take him off topic politically. And what we talked about is that's kind of what happens in our lives. Um, for us, Jesus will push in and he'll be telling us this is what he wants us to do. And you need to get a hold of your sin and you need to revamp your life and you need to turn your life around. And what we like to do is say, well, Jesus, tell me what you think about Biden. And Jesus is saying, look, I need you to... Uh, gossip less. I need you to love me more. We say, well, what do you think about Trump? And we get into these political questions, and that's basically what we found just a couple weeks ago when we met together, is that that's what the Pharisees were trying to do, is they were trying to distract Jesus with politics. And today what we're going to see is that Instead of coming and trying to distract him with politics, they're going to try to distract him with theology. They're going to try to ask him some questions that theologically he'll have to answer. And their hopes are that it will make him forget and make him not kind of push into their lives. It's just going to distract him. But what we'll see is that Jesus will say, look, you could have all the theology right and not have what's most important, and that's relationship with him. Remember, the book of Matthew has been talking about stepping outside of the kingdom of the world and into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And it's this dichotomy where he's talking about that, and we have to be in the kingdom of God. 
And what we'll see is that Jesus is saying, look, you can have the right theology. You can know enough about me and still not get what you're going after. So this is what it says in Matthew 22, verse 23. It says, the same day the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection and they asked him a question. And it's important that they didn't believe in a resurrection. It's important to know why they didn't believe in a resurrection because for them, they had lots of power, the Sadducees did. And so if resurrection was true, it would kind of change the power dichotomy in their lives. They would be able to do some things or they wouldn't be able to do some things if resurrection were true. And it would kind of overthrow some of the power struggles, not just power struggles, the power sources and structures in their life. And they didn't want any part of that. And not only that, but the Sadducees also didn't believe in the entirety of the Bible. And we're just talking about the Old Testament here, but they didn't believe in the entirety of the Old Testament, the Sadducees, they only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the books that, that Moses wrote. So they only believed in those books. And when they would read those books, there was no resurrection theology anywhere they could find in those first five books of the Bible because resurrection theology kind of gets more developed in the prophetic books of the Bible. And these guys didn't take the whole scripture and apply it to their lives and say that it had authority to speak to them. That's what we want you to be able to do. That's why we walk through scripture the way that we do is because we want scripture to have the authority in your life. We want it to be the place where the basis of your knowledge and understanding comes from. We want it to be that rock solid place in your life. We want it to be where you go to when things are getting difficult. When you're going through the storms of your life, we want the, the Bible and the word to be where you go for help. It's not just about reading what other people think, but it's about using scripture and applying it to your own life. That's why it's so important that you get into the word. It's what's solid. Because people will let you down. Churches might let you down. But you need to be able to get to the word and you need to believe it from beginning to the end because it's fully true. And if it's fully true, it should be fully authoritative in your life. But the Sadducees didn't believe that. And here what we see is that Jesus is pushing back. Look at verse 29. It says, But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. And he's saying, Look, you guys aren't leaning in on what is important. You don't have your authority in the right place. And it sounds like he's almost scared for them. And for some of you, scriptures aren't a formative part of your existence. It's not meaningful in your life. And he's pushing back against you. And he's saying, look, you've got to use the scripture in your life. He's telling them, look, the scripture is what's important. And he's basically telling us the same exact thing. He's saying, look, you've got to get to the place where scripture is important in your life and it has authority to speak. And the moment they try to start playing these games and pushing back, he says, look, you don't even know the scriptures. The Sadducees didn't believe, but he's about to prove it to them. Verse 30, it says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are any given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So no one is married in heaven. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, verse 31, and as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? And listen to what he says here. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And it's fascinating 
that when Jesus is talking to these Sadducees who, who only believe in the first five books of the Bible, that the proof that he is going to give them is from some place where they actually would have already read. It's in a place in the scripture where they actually believed was true. They recognize it as being the authoritative word of God. And he's saying, look, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Don't you understand the resurrection reality? And they thought that the resurrection was silly. They thought that we all die and we just become spirit people. Some of us, we still have that idea in the world today. We just live our life now when we become this disembodied spirit. And we get to this place and heaven and it's clouds and, and diapers and people are playing harps. And that's what we think heaven is going to be like. The problem is, is that that, that isn't true biblically. And secondly, most of us don't really get excited about that vision of heaven. It's hard to get excited about clouds and, and diapers and, and wings and all that. We don't have an appetite for it. And if we don't have an appetite for it, it means that we don't have an appetite for heaven. If that's what we believe and that's what we think. And we were created physical and we're designed to love all these physical things. And what Jesus and the New Testament theology says is that the final state is that of resurrection. And when the new Jerusalem comes down and meets earth and we are resurrected, that's the final physical state. What he's telling us is that in the end, all of the evil in the world will all be turned about and it will all be resurrected and it will all be done away with. All the evil, all the destruction in the world will be reversed. For some reason, we get this idea that the, the world will just be nuked and it'll be this new world. But what he's talking about is that resurrection is about being restored physically, just like Jesus. He was the, he was the prototype in his resurrection. It's a restored, resurrected earth. And eternity is this place that is physical. There's this physicalness when it comes to heaven. And here's the thing that we have to understand is that if we aren't physical in eternity, then in essence, God loses. Think about that for a minute. If sin destroyed the body in such a way that we can't live that way for eternity, then what he wanted, what God wanted, didn't come to fruition. And we lose. But God created us and he wanted us to be able to live with him forever. In the garden. But Satan ruined it all. And if all we were going to be was this disembodied spirit. That's not what he wanted. That's not the way he designed it. I think to the, to the movie Moana, Tafiti doesn't defeat the evil, it restores her. This big fire demon, she doesn't destroy her. She gives her her heart back and the evil gets redeemed. And that's a unique way to look at it. It's a restorative story. And of course, there are some things that won't get redeemed. Satan, for one. But there are some things that he is going to restore and bring back and give life to. <clears throat> Let's go back to verse 32. He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. 
They were astonished. He's talking to them. He's bringing up something that they'll understand. And when he calls all this, and all of a sudden they realize what he's saying. And my question for you is, is when you hear the story of Jesus, are you still astonished? Or has it just become second nature and you don't think much about it anymore? Like when he gives you this great restoration, every delight you can imagine, does it still excite you? Does it make you want to participate in that? So they try to trap him. Back up to verse 24, it says this, saying, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So they're going to try to show him how dumb and childish it is for the resurrection and to believe in it. And he says, according to the law, if I'm married and I die, my brother has to marry my wife. And that's because... She couldn't survive without a husband in, this, in the society that they lived in. She just couldn't make it. And so the job of the brother would be to take your brother's wife and, and to marry her and support her and to take care of her. So it's like, you know, don't worry, I have a, my brother, he can marry you. Verse 24 says, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow. And raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too, the second and third, down to the seventh. After all, after them all, the woman died. <coughs> and I think about this, and I'm thinking, what in the world is this woman doing <laughs> to all these guys? How is she knocking them off? But then after them all, they say, after she's knocked off all seven of them, she finally dies. And the question they're going to ask is, whose wife will she be? It's a silly question. If, if she has seven husbands, is she going to walk around with them all? And it's this really crazy thing. So verse 28 says, in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. And Jesus tells us, you know, we will be like angels in heaven. We won't be married. Verse 29. He says, you're wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of the Abraham, the God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he's saying, look, there's, there's no marriage in heaven. Some of us say, well, what? Here's the reality. The reason there's no marriage in heaven is because we'll have a pleasure that eclipses marriage and here's what he's trying to teach them in all of this through this whole idea of, of marriage and who gets to marry who and who doesn't and which one is she going to be married to the whole thing that he's trying to teach them <coughs> is that the kingdom in the resurrection the kingdom now in the resurrection also is so much better than anything that we can even imagine. The pleasure there, excuse me, is so much greater than anything that we can have on this earth. And in the resurrection, and we're not we're not going to be angels. We're not going to be flying around with wings and, 
and watching people. What would it say about Jesus if when I was in his presence, all I wanted to do was look back on the people of earth and all the pain? But we won't do that. Because everything that he has is so much better. And that's what he's trying to teach in this moment. It's not just about the resurrection and, 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 and marriage, but what he's trying to teach you is that what is coming, the kingdom is better. And there's only one way to get there and that's through him. And the question is, do you believe that? Do you still believe that the kingdom is better than the kingdom of this world? And what he wants you to realize is that everything that is to come, that his kingdom is better than anything that this world has to offer. And the question for you this morning as you sit at home is, do you believe that? Are you ready to give him the keys to your life and walk out of the kingdom of this world and into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven and bow your knee to him so that you can live with him eternally. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you. We praise you. Jesus, we just love you. Lord, we just pray for all of those that are sick, not just here in our congregation, Father, but all across the world. Lord, we just pray that you would touch them. Father, we just pray that you would just be with us and you would help us to grow closer to you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Have a great day.